Okay, and welcome while we read about Sherman's March to the Sea. And this was a military campaign designed to break the Southern spirit. The tide of battle has turned in favor of the Union, but the war has been going on for quite a while. And Lincoln unleashes General Sherman on the South. And this is total war. To give an idea of a brief synopsis of what goes on with this in Sherman's march through Georgia, um, Sherman's campaign brought war to the actual farmhouses of the South. Sherman's march through Georgia happens from May, generally speaking, to September of 1864. He brought about 100,000 men with him, and Sherman left Chattanooga, Tennessee in May of 1864 to invade Georgia, and he originally was facing Confederate General Joseph E. Johnston. However, Johnston was very much the tactician. He always tried to avoid the, the classic just charge right at him and go out. He tried to always flank and everything, but Johnston never had enough men. And facing against Sherman, who was also an excellent tactician, they would just constantly try to flank each other, get on each other's sides and attack the sides. Um, but without the men to do it, Johnston kept getting outflanked. And every time he got outflanked, instead of fighting it out and inevitably losing, he would retreat. And he just slowly lost more and more ground. And eventually, uh, Confederate President um, Jefferson Davis replaces him with John Bell Hood because Davis had been sending letter after letter to Johnston, you've got to attack, you've got to attack, we're going to lose the city of Atlanta. And he wouldn't do it unless he thought he could send a chance of winning and without the troops, it wouldn't really happen. John Bell Hood, a Texan, he did attack and he, taught, he attacked fervently and fiercely, but faced the same issues that Johnston had. And without the men, John Bell Hood also inevitably lost. Um, John Bell Hood eventually abandoned Atlanta on September 1st, uh, leaving the city to Sherman on the next day. The fall of Atlanta lifted northern morale, which had been staggered by Grant's heavy casualties in pursuit of Lee, uh, who was fighting elsewhere, and contributed to Republican victories politically in November of 1864. And when asked about the destruction, the absolute brutal destruction of the city of Atlanta, I mean, it was sacked, it was looted, it was burned to the ground. Atlanta was basically gone after this. Sherman said, war is hell. To give you an idea of the kind of destruction that happened in this, this is an actual photograph of a ruined railway near Atlanta that was destroyed by Sherman's troops. Uh, in his march to the sea, uh, before he left Atlanta, Sherman confiscated or destroyed pretty much all useful equipment. Uh, Sherman cut a swath through Georgia 60 miles wide and 300 miles long, systematically destroying factories, cotton gins, warehouses, bridges, railways, and public buildings. He let his soldiers loot, uh, and looting was rampant. They would just walk into people's homes that were empty and steal anything they wanted, and then they'd burn the house down. Uh, Sherman's advance was virtually unopposed because the last major army that stood in his way had been John Bell Hood's and Johnston's before him, and he had defeated them. There was nothing left. So he just did what he wanted, which was to show the South, you want to leave? This is war? And I will show you what war is. It is destruction. And by when he finally reached Savannah, which is actually on the coast uh, in December, it fell to the Union on December 22nd, and Sherman presented the city of Savannah to President Lincoln as a Christmas gift. So let's get to reading. Uh, the Atlanta campaign, which lasts from May 7th, September 20th, uh, September 2nd, 1864. Abraham Lincoln was up for re-election in 1864 against Democratic nominee, former General George B. McClellan. McClellan's platform was that the war should not be continued and that the South should be recognized as an independent country. Lincoln desperately needed a military win in order to secure his election and therefore continuance of the war. Atlanta, Georgia, was both the manufacturing hub of the South and Union Major General William Tecumseh Sherman, on orders from Lincoln, invaded on May 7th with a series of very carefully calculated flanking maneuvers. He forced Confederate General Johnston to fall back to Atlanta. Jefferson Davis did not want to lose Atlanta without manly blows, as he uh, said it, being struck, so he appointed the Texan General John Bell Hood to strike said blows. Hood replaced Johnson 
and he definitely lashed out in a daring series of counterattacks, but Sherman simply had too many men. Sherman shelled Atlanta for many days and as well flanked south surrounding Atlanta. Sherman knew that Hood was retreating when he heard the Confederate ammunition train detonate in a massive explosion. Afterward, Sherman ordered the burning of Atlanta's business district. He knew that he could not hold the city while also continuing on his march. Between the Union shelling earlier and the burning, once Sherman's army left Atlanta, approximately 40% of the city had been absolutely and utterly destroyed. Then you have Sherman's famous march to the sea from November 15th uh, to December 21st, 1864. The campaign uh, from leaving Atlanta and marching to Savannah, a major city on the sea, um, began with Sherman's troops leaving the captured city of Atlanta on November 15th and ended with the capture of the major port city of Savannah on December 21st. So you have Atlanta, a manufacturing hub where they build things, and Savannah, a a transportation hub. So you make things in Atlanta's. On, in Atlanta, ship it to Savannah, and from Savannah, they would send it out to the rest of the Confederacy or overseas to, to buy and sell and participate in trade. So by knocking out both of these, you were really crippling the Southern economy, which was Sherman's goal. Uh, Sherman's forces followed a scorched earth policy, and a scorched earth policy is where you destroy military targets as well as industry, infrastructure, and civilian property And the goal was to disrupt the Confederacy's economy and their transportation networks. Having destroyed the railroads, Sherman's army lived off the land, burning anything they, they themselves could not use along their way to the sea. The operation broke the back of the Confederacy, and it helped lead to the Confederacy's eventual surrender. And what a a lot of people don't realize is that there's a very interesting fallout from Sherman's March to the Sea. And that fallout is Special Field Order Number 15, which occurred January 16th, 1865. Have you ever heard of 40 Acres and a Mule? This is the origin of that story. The orders, uh, Special Field Order Number 15, were issued following after Sherman's March to the Sea. They were intended to address the immediate problem of dealing with the tens of thousands of black refugees who were following Sherman's march in search of protection and to, quote, assure the harmony of action in the area of operations. General Sherman met for four days with 20 local black ministers, their advisors, and with the U.S. Secretary of War in Savannah, Georgia, to determine what to do with the refugees. The ministers argued that without the land, Former slaves would never know true independence because remember back in those days, land, you could farm, you can make your own living, land equaled independence. Sherman decided to issue special field order number 15, which what did special order number 15 do? It divided up 400,000 acres of former plantation, that's where slavery was primarily happening, lands along the coast. And these lands were going to be taken over by the government, divided up, and that and disseminated. That means given out to the refugee freedmen. So these former freed slaves, they are now going to receive the very land that they worked on as slaves. The orders had little concrete effect because President Andrew Johnson, vice president to Abraham Lincoln. The issue is, is that once these orders were put into place, A little while later, after the war ends, Lincoln is shot. Andrew Johnson takes over, and he is a Southern sympathizer. So, Johnson issues a proclamation that returned the lands to Southern owners as long as they took a loyalty oath, which most of them did. Johnston granted amnesty, forgiveness, to most former Confederates and allowed the rebel states to elect new governments. These governments, which often included ex-Confederate officials, soon enacted black codes. These were measures designed to control and repress the recently freed slave population. General Saxton and his staff at the Charleston, South Carolina Freedmen's Bureau uh, office refused to carry out President Johnson's wishes 
and denied all applications to having lands returned. However, in the end, Johnston and his allies removed General Saxton, his staff, and most of the freedmen lost the lands granted to them by Special Field Order Number 15. So, although mules are not mentioned in the orders, they were a main source for the expression 40 acres and a mule. The, the expression evokes the federal government's failure to redistribute land after the Civil War and the economic hardship that African Americans suffered as a result. You see, the issue is, is that all this land, prime farming land on the coast, so you could even have, with this, you could, if it had been allowed to continue, you could have had southern former slaves making their own ports, building their own cities there, and eventually having their own form of integration and having their own manufacturing hubs, their own transportation hubs. And they'd be able to make their own products using the land that they had and ship it out using access to the sea. That's real independence. That's real freedom. However, President Andrew Johnson, who takes over after Lincoln, gets it all destroyed. And so the idea of saying 40 acres and a mule usually communicates the idea of, ah, what are we going to do? They're just going to take it away from us. It's the idea that, okay, the slaves were freed, but they weren't given any way to earn success in the future. They were given nothing, not even real opportunity. Back in those days, to have real opportunity, one required land. That's what this was designed to do, but it was taken away. I hope you're learning, and I hope you're having fun.